own businesses is um, kind of represented by this image. Um, this is a picture of market share gains and losses in the gaming business. So uh, games, electronic games. And we start the electronic game sector back in the 60s and 70s with arcade games. And you would go to a physical place, you put coins in this game, and you would play. You know, and the, the game and the, and the machine were the same. Um, and that was how it got started. Then that gave way to games that were played on dedicated devices, often handheld ones. So your Nintendo or your Sony machine would have a game on it. And then that was the next wave. And then we had games that were played on general purpose devices, like computers. And this is when you got shrink-wrapped software uh, that would, um, you, know, you could play many games now on a computer. And now that's given way to games that are played on handheld devices, games that are played inside social media, so games that are played on Facebook, for example. Um, now here's the point. The pattern is what I'd like you to take away from this. There's a period of time in which an advantage is conceived. There's a period of time in which you ramp it up, you grow it. There's then a period of time where you get to exploit that advantage. And then things change. Customers move on. Technology changes. Um, some new invention makes what you're doing irrelevant. And the advantage goes into erosion. Now, I'm not saying it always does, but that's a pattern you want to be aware of, you want to be paying attention to. And it's worth asking the question, well, where are we in this, in this wave of, of advantage? What's behind us? What do we need to be looking out of? What's in front of us that we might need to be moving forward to? And so this chart's a little wordy, but what you want to be paying attention to are the early warnings that an helping me very much, uh, that an old advantage might be changing. Um, and the thing you want to be watching for are the things that precede uh, the numbers. Because by the time it shows up in your numbers, that's much more difficult to recover. Right? So you want to be looking for things like um, customers, and this would be a Clay Christensen phenomenon, customers are finding simpler or cheaper solutions to be good enough. Um, you're not able to get the talent you would like. Um, competitions coming from places we didn't really expect. So those kinds of early warnings are the ones that you want to be paying attention to. And as we heard earlier this morning, it's so easy when you're busy and you're traveling and your life is demanding so much from you to just come to work and do your job. And I'm going to argue the role of leadership increasingly has to be to do that, but also to make sure the organization is paying attention to what might be going on around you. Now this brings me to the topic of where do I look for competition? You know, where do I think competition might be coming from? And in the old days of strategy, competition was overwhelmingly within your industry. So if you were in semiconductors, your competition was other semiconductor manufacturing firms. If you were in automobiles, your other car making companies. And that's okay. Um, that was a very traditional way of looking at strategy. But what we're finding today is competition actually jumps, in many cases, across industry lines. And so one of the most significant things you have to decide as a leader is what is the arena that I'm actually competing in? What is it I'm competing for? And sometimes the most difficult to track down competition is that kind of oblique competition that's competing with your company for something that you need, even if it's not within your industry. So we're well represented here by, by banking, by media, you know, organizations like that. Well, you're competing with other ways of getting financial needs met. You're competing with other ways of consuming content. And those are very important competitors that need to be taken into account as you're formulating your um, strategy. So just to illustrate further, this um, chart here represents a study that was done by the Wall Street Journal. And they were interested in learning what the impact was on household spending uh, of
of the kind of advance of smartphones and internet connections in general. And so they did a study measuring the changes in American household spending from 2007 to 2014. And these are the results. And what you see is Americans across the board were spending less on things like um, apparel, clothing, less on automotive, less on eating outside the home, more on stuff like pet care and pets. New. But the two biggest growth areas were mobile telephony and internet access to the home. Now, if you're you know, selling clothing, let's say, and you're benchmarking yourself against other clothing people, while your market's evaporating from under you, you could be missing that really important storyline that your category is becoming less relevant to consumers than it had been before. So I think this notion of selecting your arena and what are the needs that you want to serve and how you're going to do that is a pretty critical idea. And many companies have um, done a great job redefining their business in terms of the arenas that they're serving. So uh, to take a couple of examples, uh, I'll use a historical one um, from Coca-Cola. I don't know Coca-Cola. Uh, so back in the uh, in the day when Robert Vegetta was the was Waker, rather was the CEO of Coca-Cola, he held a management meeting, and all his leaders were whining. Basically, they were saying Pepsi is a problem, and the markets are mature, and anyone that wants to buy, you know, cola has bought cola. It's going to be very difficult to growth. And he said instead, guys, this is not the way you should be thinking about it. The average human being requires 64 ounces of fluid every day to stay alive. Your mission is not to sell more Coca-Cola. Your mission is to increase the number of those ounces of fluid that are sold by the Coca-Cola company. I personally think that's a little creepy, just between the things. But it got them on the track to really think differently about what they were trying to accomplish. It got them into things like Dasani still water, which is one of their biggest products. It got them thinking about energy drinks. It got them thinking about a fruit-based nutrition. Opened their minds to new opportunities uh, that could be much more relevant to what they were doing. Would it be better if I used the handheld mic? What do you think? I don't know. We'll, we'll soldier on with this, I guess. Um, anyway, so I think the question, the question of what is your arena really is a really critical one. And, and there's some suggestions in the book about how you can find new arenas. But I think not limiting yourself by the boundaries of your particular industry is pretty key. That one? Okay. And then. Okay, so this is when I stop being a business school professor and start being a rock star. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thinking about the arenas that you want to serve, I think is a pretty critical management decision because that's really about leadership. You know, uh, Gajueta did not let others define his arena, and I think that similar concept can apply to the businesses that are here. So if you think about companies that have successfully reframed the arenas that they're competing in, and Apple would be a great example, right? To go from being a computer company to being a company that makes products that are indispensable to our everyday lives. That's a pretty big step in terms of changing what they compete for. So I think one of the ideas I'd like you to think about, and perhaps we'll explore this in the panel discussion, is as you move out of old exhausted arenas and start to move into new areas, what are some of the ways that you could really rethink how you could be relevant in that sort of space? So here's a specific example that I would encourage those of you here to, to think about. Um, and we've talked a lot about the internet of things. Well, if you think about it, once you have intelligence, inexpensive intelligence, embedded in products that are connected to each other, it creates huge new ways that you could add value, that you could create complete experiences, that you could um, you know, really think through how 
to develop a different relationship with your customers. So let me give an example from history, and then I'd like to encourage you to think about what this might look like um, going forward. So the historical example actually begins in a conference room in Shanghai, where I am sitting with a senior team of leaders from the Honeywell Corporation, and their challenge is, how do I differentiate myself in the production of, for example, brake shoes for airlines? So this is the housing that goes in the wheels of a, an airplane that help to you know, stop it and slow it down and so, so brake shoes. And it's a tough business. I mean, their competitors are world class. You know, they're, they're competing against General Electric and they're competing against uh, Rock Rolls Royce and, and so forth. Uh, so it's a very tough business, very sophisticated customers, very big on price, price in, in the difficulty. So they're really scratching their heads. And so we said, well, look, why don't we, rather than you know, worrying about the existing competition, why don't we go back to first principles? So here's a question I think you can usefully ask at any time in your business, which is, who are the customers that buy airline brake shoes? Or whatever product it is you want to think about. And they tend to be airlines. And then you say to yourself, well, OK, what is it that keeps those buyers, those customers, awake at night? What, what do they worry about in the course of doing business? And it turns out one of the big things that those kinds of customers worry about is when a piece of equipment goes out of service unexpectedly, it causes all kinds of operational havoc, and it's, it's a, a big problem. So then we said, well, OK, let's go back even further. What are some systemic things that cause aircraft to get taken out of service? And it turns out some proportion of those occasions take place because of the undercarriage of the plane, something about the wheels or the brake shoes or whatever. Uh, so we said, well, can we think of any reason that there's a systemic variance in that, you know, that, 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 that changes over time? Well, if you really look at it, and this was a fascinating uh, bit of research, there are two basic kinds of pilots in the world, people that fly planes. So the first kind of pilot are Air Force pilots. They get to land their planes on runways. And they are trained by their respective forces to be very gentle. So the plane comes down, the wheels kiss the ground, and a perfect landing is when you're in the airplane and you don't even feel it. It's awesome. The other kind of pilot is a Navy pilot. They don't have the luxury of a runway, right? They have to get that thing down on an aircraft carrier. And so how do they land a plane? Whack! Right? Because the wheels have to get caught and it's got to be slowed down immediately. Now, when these folks leave their respective services, they get you know, retrained and they get sent off to civilian use and so forth. Um, but over time, like many of us, we kind of slip. You slip back to what you're doing. So this is the idea. And it was a very early Internet of Things idea. We said, you know, if we put inexpensive sensors in the brake housing of an airplane, we can actually start creating flows of information about how the plane is flown and whether more training is needed. We could begin to detect in advance before the plane would break and, and, and actually repair it before the out-of-service incident occurred. Um, and this turned out to be a huge differentiator. Now, you can't pin this to an individual pilot that's not consistent with the, their employment rules, but you can use it to say, hey, you know, this airport could use some help there, this one could use some things there. Now, today, that business has expanded enormously, and Honeywell now is an entire information division, which is making a lot of money by helping their customers understand what's going on with their assets in a very um, informed way. So rather than just running machinery and hoping it doesn't break down, you've now got all these ways of learning what's really going on with the equipment that, that you own. So I think for a lot of your companies, you are perfectly positioned to begin to think about how you can offer really value-added really interesting new services by connecting things that could never be connected either inexpensively enough or with enough precision before. And I think the new technologies are allowing us to begin to uh, do that, which is, which I think is really exciting. 
Um, okay, so what is a specific set of things that are changing in the world of strategy? We'll talk about that next, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, innovation and what that means for you. So I think the new playbook for strategy covers what I call six areas uh, that are different than the historical way we've thought of them. Now, I don't think they're bad. I just think they're different. So we've gone from a world where we are assuming stability is the normal thing and change is the weird thing to a world where we are assuming the need for constant adjustments in how we do business. I call this continuous reconfiguration. And when you look at companies that seem to be very good at moving from wave to wave, here's what you don't see. You don't tend to see huge wrenching reorganizations. You don't tend to see massive layoffs. What you do see are lots and lots of small changes that over time add up to pretty significant changes, but it doesn't happen all at once. Uh, so being able to continuously reconfigure the roles people are in, the way units are structured, the way reporting structures work, very valuable, very important. Second thing, and I'm hoping you get to talk about this a little bit in the panel, is something I call healthy disengagement. So if you think about that chart of the coming and going of the different organizations in the gaming space, you know, by the time arcade games are no longer the way people want to play games, right, you need to get resources out of those so that they can be repurposed to some other faster growth uh, area. And yet when you talk to companies, very few of them have an actual process for disengaging, pulling resources out. And it's ironic to me, because when you talk to companies and you say, tell me about your quality process, tell me about your personnel process, tell me about your process for onboarding people, they'll, they'll have things to say. And yet if you say, tell me about your disengagement process, they look at you, blank looks, right? We do it, we do it because we have to, but it's often very painful it takes far longer than it should, and it can sometimes consume resources that if you thought about it could be much better put into trying to find new innovations. So to go back to BlackBerry for a minute, think of the millions and millions of, of you know, Canadian dollars this company has put into trying to get back into the smartphone game. And you know, if you really thought about it, maybe they'd be better off just saying, okay, you know, that'll be a smaller business, the way Fuji did with, with film, and we're going to re reinvest in diversifying into other areas. So I think healthy disengagement becomes pretty uh, important. The third difference is in traditional business, we are used to allowing the profits of that business to be spent in budgetary terms by the powerful people in the organization, so by the leaders of the existing divisions or profit and loss businesses. Now here's the trouble. What happens when those businesses come under pressure is that those leaders' natural incentive is to reinvest in defending their existing advantage rather than seeking to repurpose the resources into something that's new. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the Danish firm Lego. Lego? In a phenomenal success story in a very difficult environment. Uh, so toys is really hard as children are playing more with electronics and other things that take their time. Um, you know, it's much, much harder to capture the time and attention and share a wallet for children's playthings. And Lego's done a fantastic job. One of the things their CEO insists on every year is that each of his profit and loss leaders, each of his business divisions, are forced at the end of the year to take 10% of the profits they've generated and put those into a central pool. Now think about that. He's simultaneously creating a pot of resources that can be used for innovation, but look at what he's also doing on the efficiency front. He's saying, look, you're gonna have 10% less to work with as a division leader. So you know you have to be thinking about disengaging, being more efficient, running your business more uh, effectively 
At the same time, we've got this pool of resources. So that's, that's the first principle. Next, though, what he does with his team is he says, we are collectively, as a leadership team, now going to look at the opportunities facing us, and we will decide where that 10% of profitability is going to be spent. So as a team, they're able to now say, you know, it's transparent, it's fair, there are participants in the process, but it has this effect of moving resources out of exhausted areas and moving them into areas that represent potential growth. I find that really inspiring because it's done in a very humane way. It's not like you're a winner and you're a loser because your business isn't doing this. It's as a team, we are going to effectively work together to decide where those resources are going to be allocated. Very um, great kind of best practice to me. The fourth thing, which we'll talk about in a minute, is innovation. And it's come up here, I'm sure you've heard this from Clayton Christensen, those of you that were here. But I think the big difference today is that we used to think of innovation as something that, you know, a bolt of lightning came down and someone in research had an aha moment and, you know, that, that kind of brilliant once in a lifetime kind of thing. And a very typical thing that happens in companies is somebody will say, you know, we need more innovation around here. So you, 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 go form a skunk works. You know, go, go think about how you can think great thoughts and bring them into the world, which is great. And that works in a world where competitive advantages last for a long time. When your advantages get shorter and shorter, you can't afford to leave innovation to chance has to become an actual proficiency, uh, something that happens on, on a, not on a schedule necessarily, but it happens on a rhythm, something that happens routinely, where you've got the right people focusing on the right parts of the product life cycle. And I think that can be done. I don't think this is some mysterious, wizard-like sort of thing that only a few companies get. We've seen stellar examples of how companies can begin to make this a much more um, uh, rigorous process. Everyone from a, a hard goods company like Whirlpool, right, all the way through to banks like HDFC Bank in India in the banking sector that are really building this into the DNA of their companies. So I think this can be done. The fifth thing that's different is we used to think of leaders as people that would formulate a plan, would have all the information, and that would execute against that plan in a very structured way. And that was what kind of hierarchical leadership really was, because the theory of the case was that all information came up to the top of the company, and that's who had the biggest view, and then the orders would be sent back down, and everybody would kind of march along uh, in, uh, in um, agreement. Now, I think we're starting to really see the emergence of a new kind of leader uh, today. And much more leaders allowing decisions to be made where the information about what's going on actually survives. Because by the time you get to the top of a very large and complicated company, you don't really know. You're probably, in fact, one of the least qualified people to be able to weigh in on an operational problem or a customer issue or whatnot. So I think increasingly the role of the leader is becoming a facilitator, a coach, someone who releases the energy of his or her people to actually solve problems within a framework, you know, within some kind of strategic framework, which is where strategy and leadership to me really come together. That you need to have clarity about that framework. I'm also very fond of saying to, to leaders, you don't have to be right. In a world that's very volatile, the chances of your being right 100% of the time are almost zero. But at any given point in time, you do have to be clear. You don't want people confused. So part of this defining an arena, defining how we're going to compete, is that reduction in complexity. That for this week, you know, here are the things we're really going to prioritize and focus on. So it's a new way of thinking about what leadership really is. Lastly, and I think this is pretty relevant here in Taiwan, uh, is a change in how we think about careers. You know, the traditional kind of career ladder where you start at level 17 and you get promoted and eventually you get to level three and that's wonderful. 
that still exists, but I think more and more we're going to see certain people operating with what I call a tour of duty, career mindset. Uh, and some of the big consulting firms, big project-based construction firms already work this way largely, but I think it's going to become much more mainstream, that you identify a project or a challenge, you put together resources or a team to tackle that, and uh, then when that challenge has been dealt with, people stop and say, well, am I, am I signing up for the next challenge, the next tour of duty, as Reid Hoffman famously calls it, or am I moving up a lot? Um, we're also seeing far more porous organizational boundaries. People are now loosely tied to organizations, even when they're not necessarily working for the same corporate structure. And we're seeing a lot more networks, a lot more um, the personal ties people have being important uh, to what they can do next. I think that's a pretty critical transition. Now, as leaders, how are you going to get talented people to agree to stay with you, to agree to help you achieve your goals? I think that's a very important question. Those of you in the talent business, right? do you even know where your best talents lie? Do you know how attractively you can recruit them? Do they feel that they're going to be more valuable by working with you than they would if they did something else, than they would if they went to work for somebody else? And I think it's, you need to have that, that value very clearly crystallized in your mind. Why are we the right place to work for you at this moment? Um, so just to kind of illustrate where some of these thoughts came from, so that, that you, know, you see the research background, I, um, I did a study where I looked at close to 5,000 companies. These were global firms who had at some time in a 10-year study period achieved a market capitalization of over a uh, billion dollars US. And I asked a simple question, how many of them had been able to grow steadily in the 10 years leading up to the end of 2009. And I found exactly 10 companies. Um, and what's fascinating about them to me is that they aren't very similar. They're in different sectors. There's some high tech, there's some financial services, there's some consulting. Um, and when I really did case studies looking at them, what I found these firms have been able to do is combine certain kinds of stability with a certain amount of dynamism. So where were they stable? They were very stable in culture, values, um, networks, a lot of close intimate ties with customers, close intimate ties with suppliers, so a lot of stability. At the same time, they were very agile. They were able to move in and out of markets. They had very good um, ways of budgeting and rebudgeting their companies. So there was a lot that made them faster, even as certain core things were very stable. Now, over the years since I've been reflecting on this, because it seems like kind of a paradox, how would you have that much stability in a world that's changing? And what I think these companies figured out is how do we encourage people to take the courageous steps and the risks and be willing to try new things and also make them feel safe. People who are scared, people who are anxious, are not gonna be at their innovative best. They're not gonna be willing to take a risk. They're not gonna be willing to try new things because they're afraid. So you have to create these pockets of safety, even as you're encouraging experimentation and uh, in ventures into the new uh, world. So just to give you a couple of illustrations of how they do this, um, Infosys, which is the big Indian outsourcer, they rebudget their entire company every quarter. Isn't that amazing? This 200, 300,000 person company, every quarter they go back and say, are we needing to move resources around in some much more agile way? And I asked their head of strategy, who manages this process, and I said, doesn't that create a huge amount of work? He said, no, we have very good systems. We can do that. And I don't want to have to wait a year and be dragged down by resources from the past in order to learn about a problem. I need to be able to get changes to occur much more quickly in my organization. So that's an example of a very concrete practice that facilitates this. 
So it's this idea of continually adjusting your resources and, and what you are uh, doing. Um, the next thing we talked about was disengagement. And an, an interesting example of this is one of our um, telecommunications operators in the US, uh, a company called Verizon. And Ivan Seidenberg came into Verizon and he had a look at their portfolio of activities. And what he concluded was physical phone books, paper phone books, probably not a growth business. Uh, landline telephony, it's still throwing off a lot of cash, but it's going to be a business in decline. And as Verizon, we're still several steps away from our customer, and we could be providing a much more integrated set of services to our customers. So he went through what at the time was considered foolhardy, the, the move to sell his physical phone book business. He started to divest landlines, and he put the money and people into um, fiber optics to the home, into being able to offer content that allows Verizon today to compete with um, established cable companies and television companies. In other words, he created a whole new vector of growth for the firm by being uh, unafraid to shut down some of the existing businesses that had been very successful for them. So think about that. You know, most companies, if we are to be honest with each other, they have zombie businesses. You know, zombies, just give us a little more time. I'm sure we can turn it around, right? Sort of like creatures from the black lagoon. And a lot of times we don't go looking for them. Um, and so they can consume uh, people and resources and energy. Whereas if you created more focus and, and got rid of them, so you could actually free up a lot of energy in the firm to go do uh, some new things. Now I mentioned uh, Lego's practice of moving resources out of their divisions and putting them into new growth opportunities. Um, this is hard, this is hard, because you need some way of counteracting traditional power structures from the ability of an organization to allocate resources. So, so let's try a thought experiment, shall we? Imagine to yourselves that you are Mr. Sony Walkman and they were always misters, I'm sorry to say. Mr. Sony Walkman, at the height of that business's success. Your office is right next to the Sony Walkman Museum, which is where every model of Walkman that's ever been created, you know, the, the, the display of these guys. And you know, you come to a Commonwealth talk, or you listen to Clay Christensen, and you think, wow, you know, could I be disrupted? You know, if you even had the courage to ask that, that would be kind of interesting. So if you think that person, about that person, what got them where they are? Well, you know, little boring gizmos that take content in album form off some kind of fixed media and replay it, right? With enormous fidelity for an audience uh, that, that can uh, um, be portable and, and listen to music. Double A batteries, very important, right? That kind of thing. So you invite some folks from, say, R&D to come and share with you their vision for what the future of portable music playing could be like. And they come back to you and they say, ah, in the future, no more AA batteries, gone. No more fixed media, in fact, no more albums. It's all going to be songs in digital format and they're going to fly through the air and land on your hard drive. Oh, and the music that we replay, it's going to be lower quality than the music we can produce today with today's technology. Think about the psychology of that leader, that manager. Are you going to embrace that vision and say, oh, fantastic, you know, let's put money into creating those new offers to make our existing offers obsolete. Probably not. If you're a typical corporate executive, the responses are more likely to be, thank you very much for your insight. Please go back to R&D where you can do minimal damage. Right? Now I'm telling this in a kind of a funny way, but it has a very serious undertone. That's not too far from what actually happened at Sony. And if you think about Sony back in the very first days of MP3 players, they had MP3 technology, 
Not only that, they had established distribution channels. They owned a music company. The only reason Apple was able to get the eventual huge position that they did in the music business was because companies like Sony could not deal with this internal resource allocation dilemma. And this is a little um, um, illustration from Wired magazine, which talked, this is going back to 1994, about the civil war inside Sony. It was internal. They did it to themselves. And I think it opened up the opportunity for a company like Apple to take advantage of the fear among the music studios that their old business model was fading and that Apple was the next, the least evil thing next to free downloads and distribution. And that's what eventually led to Apple's ascendance in that market. But I don't think it had to be that way. So think about that as you're thinking about different kinds of examples. Now, one of the things that has come up a lot in my research about Taiwan and Taiwanese companies is this notion of can we get beyond just developing things that are specification based for you know, companies for whom we're going to manufacture or produce things? How, how do we begin to think about getting beyond that? So there's a very interesting example that I, I think of when I think of this question. And it has to do with a company called Brambles. Some of you may know Brambles. They're based in Australia. And they make pallets, wooden pallets, that go all over the world. They have hundreds of millions of these things in circulation. And so their direct customers are logistics companies. So companies that provide shipping, uh, truck transportation, railroads. That's their direct customer. But what Brambles has been doing for a long time now is they said, how do we think about the problems, not of our direct customers, although we're concerned about those, how do we think about solving the problems that their customers have? Because if we can do that, we can be part of that far more comprehensive solution that, first of all, puts us first in their mind when they're thinking of who they want to do business with, but more importantly, it gives us insight into where we could be making investments. So they regularly send scouting teams to go right to the end user of a particular good or service that their direct customers do business with. So here's an example of one of their innovations. So this was Brambles. This was not the logistics players that they do business with. One of the things that supermarket leaders uh, complain about a lot is that a lot of the um, things like strawberries are perishable, and there's a lot of inventory loss as these things are shipped from the fields where they're grown to the store. A second big problem they face <laughs> is that it's very expensive in labor cost terms to take the packages that arrive and unbox them and put them on the shelves so that the consumers can take them. And so Brambles put a small team to work on thinking about how could we improve this situation. And the picture here is uh, an example. So what they do now is the pickers are given a tray which is pre-stocked with pre-labeled consumer-facing plastic boxes. As they go up and down the rows of strawberries with their gloves on, they pick the fruit, they put it right in those boxes. When the boxes are full, the boxes get handed to a runner who then stacks them up in a way that can be shipped incredibly easily and inexpensively, so they're all stacked. Now notice the fruit has only been handled once. The person picking it is the one that picks it, puts it in the box. Then when these pallets get to the store at the other end, all the people in the store have to do is lift a tray of these pallets and put them out on display because they're attractively enough designed that a consumer could take the you know, product and take it home with them. No repacking, no moving, no multiple packing and unpacking of the fruit. Now why I think this is such an interesting example and a kind of a mindset shift for a company like Brambles is this wasn't a logistics innovation, this wasn't high tech, this was going and thinking about what are the problems that our customers, customers are having and how can we be part of the solution. I think it's just hugely informative to think of cases uh, like that, that, that we, we look at. So that's part of um, innovation as a sustained capability. I've also mentioned going from simply being solution providers 
to actually defending advantages, to defining new opportunities. And a great example here is the language training company Berlitz. And Berlitz had something of an epiphany. Their, their main big business is serving companies, many like yours. And language proficiency, they thought, was their core business. What they came to realize, though, was just knowing the language wasn't really going to help their clients, leaders, function effectively in different cultural contexts. And so this insight led them to say, yes, of course we train language, but we're also going to help your people understand the context in which they're operating so that they can be effective, not just at speaking the language correctly, but effective at achieving their corporate goals. This has now become a huge growth business for them as the world becomes more global and they're trying to extend their reach into more and more companies that need to go cross-cultural. So I think it's an interesting um, thing to think about. How can we expand our footprint rather than just worrying about defending core advantages in the mainstream? Now, people often ask me, is it really true that things are faster or is this just hype, you know, that, that people think, ah, yeah, you know, the world is changing, the world is changing, the sky is falling. And I think this chart is kind of illustrative of uh, why that, I think, is actually going on, that, that our response times have to be faster, our innovation cycles have to be faster. So what you'll see in the little orange line at the bottom of this chart is that it took 19 quarters for America Online to penetrate about 20 million households. So 19 quarters of time. It took Apple's iOS nine quarters to penetrate nearly 60 million households. I mean, just an incredible shift in time scale from, uh, from one decade to the next. So if you get the feeling that every day seems to be bringing some new challenge, I wouldn't blame you. I think that's a very illustrative kind of picture of the pace of change and how it's time. So the last uh, topic I'd like to share with you, and we'll hopefully have a lot more time to talk about this in the, the panel discussion, is how do you actually build an innovation capability in a fast-moving economy? When things are going very, very quickly. And we won't have time to, to go through all of it, but I think you can start to look at what, what do we know about what that takes. So the first thing we know, and I've seen a lot of research on this, is it doesn't work with innovation to try to force fit innovations, especially if they're disruptive, into the systems and processes you have in your existing business, because they were built to do something else, right? Um, so let's say you want to go from being a contract manufacturer to being a services and solution provider. That wouldn't be a, an unusual journey for a company to take. Well, a services and solutions organization is going to have different KPIs, different probably authority structure, a different kind of talent, different business models, ways of working. So, you can see it's not going to work to just put those people underneath the mass manufacturing people. This was one of the problems Nokia had in the smartphone business because the business they grew and defined was the mass market phone business. The smartphone people didn't have a chance because they were put under that business. So what they would have had to do to get their technologies into the market, the mass market phone people weren't interested in. So you really need to think about different structures for managing innovation. So let me give you uh, an example of a company that I thought did this well. And this was IBM under Lou Gerstner. And I actually got involved with this project a little bit. Um, he was very concerned about why so many of the innovations that he'd authorized were not getting to market. And what, he, what, what came to be pretty clear was that these innovations were resting under division heads who were much more worried about meeting their quarter, meeting their numbers, and addressing today's key KPIs than they were about nourishing little innovations that were very small, um, but were expensive, you know, and, and kind of a distraction to the, the core business. So what, what we came up with was an idea that later came to be called the Emerging Business Opportunity Program. 
And what they would do is they would very carefully define an arena. So in this case, the case I'm illustrating, it was called pervasive computing. Today we call that the Internet of Things, but back then we called it pervasive computing. The idea that computers are going to be everywhere, interacting with everything. And they wanted to create this emerging business opportunity around this new set of activities. And so um, they took a guy, very senior person, Ron Atkins, you can see a picture of him there, and he had been running IBM's Unix business. This guy had 30,000 people reporting to him. I mean, this is a very senior person. And they took him out of that role. And they said, no, your job is to report directly to a senior vice president, um, Bruce Harold, who's gonna report directly to Gerstner. And your job is to figure out pervasive computing. So we're going to give you a team to think this through. What business models could it look like? What could we be doing differently? Now here's the genius of this. As he began to see what the right models could be, they started to take units out of the existing business and fold them under the EBO for pervasive computing. Now this accomplishes two very interesting things. Firstly, it starts to give the pervasive computing people revenue. They're actually making a little money, which is very valuable if you're an innovative startup because they're unpredictable, so you don't know when the revenue is going to come in, so it gives them revenue. The other thing it does is it decreases inertia in the established business. And those two things working together allowed uh, IBM under Gerstner, I think they launched 22 of these, of which something like 18 became billion dollar businesses for IBM. It was a very successful initiative. So that specific story kind of brings it to light, but I think the question you want to ask yourself is do we have a governance, funding, and structure that makes sense given that this new business may be different from our existing businesses, especially if you're going on the kind of journey that we're taking from manufacturing to solutions and um, software kinds of businesses. I'm also really big on helping companies think through what's in their portfolio of activities. And this is a, a, an important idea, especially for those of you who've spent much of your careers in the core business. Um, and it's that some of the things you're doing may be very innovative, but they're going to make your core more competitive. Some of the things you're doing are going to be like the next generation core. So when Apple goes from selling computers to selling music players, to selling tablet devices. Um, those are all next generation core kinds of investments. Some of the things you're doing are options for the future. It's a small investment you're making today, which buys you the right, but not the obligation, to make a bigger investment down the road. And so I'm a huge fan of really looking at the portfolio of things you're working on and saying, have I got enough things that are going to keep my core business strong? Have I got good candidates for my next generation core business, the next wave, if you will? And then am I investing enough in options that I'm keeping a window on opportunities? Because that's where the future really uh, lies. And so one of the things I do when I, for real, when I start working with a company on their innovation programs, I'll, uh, I'll work with them to do one of these portfolios. And we'll take a good look at whether they've got the right kinds of projects for each of these different levels of uncertainty. Another big idea, and this goes back to some work I was doing um, years ago on a concept I came to call discovery-driven planning, is that you want to be linking the reduction in uncertainty on your assumptions with the increase in resources dedicated to a specific project. You want to connect those two things. Um, one, of the, one of the research projects I, I do uh, is I, I study corporate flops, the really big ones that went terribly wrong. You know. <laughs> and I have a whole file at home, I call it my flops file. Uh, you have to lose your parent company at least $50 million to get into my flops file, that's, that's the bar. And um, what's fascinating about them is it's projects like Cargo Lifter in Germany, you know, which, which created huge hype and enthusiasm and then had technical problems, or, or Revlon's line of cosmetics, it's what's called the Vital Radiance, and it was cosmetics, makeup, directed at ladies of a certain age 
whom it turns out are not amused by being reminded of this at the cosmetics counter. <laughs> we don't like to hear that. Um, and so uh, when, when I collect all these things, what you find is a very common pattern of problems with innovation that I think are addressable. And this pattern is untested assumptions taken as fact, very few opportunities for low commitment testing, leaders personally associated with a particular strategy, all the funds up front, all the funding at once, very bad for new innovations, and a kind of a damn the torpedoes, go speed, you know, full speed ahead assumption that we have to get very big, very early in order to be successful. And I think there's a different way of doing it, which is contained in this um, idea of discovery, discovery driven, and testing your assumptions and learning as you go. Next, I think you want to be thinking about creating an environment in which intelligent failures can inform the path that you would like to go down. So Amazon, for example, just to pick a company that will be familiar to us, realized that they created something very valuable in this massive platform that they, they had. But at the time they had this insight, they said, well, is there some way we could get third parties to pay us for doing business on our platform? And so the first effort was a thing called Amazon Auctions. They tried to compete with eBay, and that didn't work. But they said, you know, we've still got this valuable asset, this platform. Maybe there's a different way we can do this. The second attempt was something called Amazon Z Shops. You had to go to a separate tab on their web page and order from there. Never took off either. So finally they said, well, what if we try listing third-party offers right on the landing page? So if you search for a refrigerator, you know, you'll have Amazon's offers plus other other providers' offers. That has taken off, and it's now about 30, 35% of their total revenue is payments from third-party providers to leverage their platform. Now, why I think that's an interesting story is that the logic underlying the, the idea was consistent throughout, but they tried different ways to realize that. So it's the difference between being persistent and being obstinate. You know, being obstinate is just doing the same thing over and over and expecting it to get you somewhere different. Persistence is saying, I think there's value and that we can capture and we're going to go ahead and do that. Never a bad idea to start with the customer. So what are the outcomes the ultimate end user or customer is trying to address and work backward into what is that mean we could do? So similar to the Bramble story, right? Find the gold in those customer outcomes that they're trying to deliver. Last thing I think you should each remember is innovation. When we think about it, we often think it's about the idea. So if I could just get that inspired idea, then I would have new markets, new products, things would open up for me. But it's really not just about the idea. And I find a lot of companies fall into this. You know, so we have innovation boot camps and thousands of post-it notes are used in the pursuit of finding the next idea. And then the idea doesn't have any place to go. So at a minimum, if you're going to build a true innovation proficiency, you need three kinds of activities. Yes, you need to get the good ideas. Of course, that's important. But you also need to incubate those ideas. Those of you that are familiar with the lean startup movement, the whole um, Steve Blank, Alexander Osterwalder, minimum viable product, those kinds of things, that's about incubation. It's taking an idea. And as Amazon did, let's test it with customers, let's see if we can make a business out of it, let's see if we can define the business model. So it's not just having ideas, it's then doing something with them that makes them real. Then, there's one more thing you have to do. Think of your core business as a huge highway. You know, it's six lanes, and it's moving very fast. And your little incubated business, which is probably small and has a few initial customers, you need to have a way of scaling that and ramping it up so that it can join with the parent company. That's the only way you're going to get it to make a material difference to your business. So that involves things like addressing the careless mistakes that you might have made as you were incubating the idea, getting robust and reliable systems in place, putting in quality processes. By the way, it may also mean you need to change the team. 
Sometimes your blank sheet of paper big idea people are not the people you want building your corporate supply chain. If I have time, let me see. I do have my time to tell you one quick story. So uh, Procter & Gamble, you're all familiar with Procter & Gamble, they had this idea to uh, look outside the boundaries of their company to find new inspiration. And one of the ideas they hit upon was a little entrepreneurial company run by a guy named John Osher, and he had previously invented a spinning lollipop. Uh, he had technology which could make a candy lollipop spin, and he sold that off to Hasbro, and then he started looking for other markets where that technology might be relevant. And he found his inspiration in a local Walmart, and what he found was that the most expensive manual toothbrush was about $10 US dollars. The least expensive electric toothbrush was about um, $50. So he said, ha, if I can create a product which has the functionality of an electric toothbrush at the price point of a manual toothbrush, maybe that's great. Now, Osher is an entrepreneur in residence. He uh, was at Wharton when I did my PhD. He started his first business when he was about eight years old. And this was the genesis of this business. His parents had been taking oil painting classes at the Chicago uh, Institute of Arts. And the oil paintings involved making pictures of nude models, so naked models, basically. And when the art class was over, this was fine. And the models, the <coughs> paintings, were taken and put up in the attic in their home. Age of eight, John Osher invites his school chums to come have a look at these pictures of naked ladies and charges them for the privilege. Is this guy going to come to your Thursday meeting? Is this guy going to fill out your spreadsheet? Is he going to you know, report to you on progress? Like, no, he wants to build businesses. And so part of the leadership skills, how do you recognize where people's skills are in those waves of advantage and make sure you've got the right talent uh, doing the right things? And I think that's a really important insight for those of you that really want to make innovation and actual um, proficiency. I ran across this example, which I thought was very interesting, of a company that has taken advantage of the Internet of Things and really kind of stretched a little bit beyond just a, a narrow kind of manufacturing base to really try to be relevant to a larger um, pool of customers. So really expanding the arena in which they compete. So I thought that was quite uh, visually interesting that they put all their kind of devices on one page and were able to show how they're you know, building the footprint beyond just the, the narrow uh, place that which they started. So I often get asked, well, wait a is there any good news in this? And I actually think there is. If advantages can't be captured by dominant companies, in other words, if advantages are more flexible or more fluid or more accessible than they have been in the past, I think that opens up a lot of opportunities. Things like Internet of Things, incredible advances in healthcare and robotics, uh, the advances that we're going to see in 3D printing. You know, I just think there's so many new arenas opening up that it's, it's very encouraging. I think it's very inspiring. So my parting thought, my formal remarks to you is this country, the companies in this country have proven incredibly skillful at becoming really meaningful players on the global stage. And that's a remarkable achievement. To take those skills to the next level and say, okay, now that we know how to do that, how do we become increasingly relevant to the end users, the ultimate customers of what we do, and figure out what these new technological opportunities are that we could leverage to become more meaningful partners uh, in a more profitable uh, context. So I hope you found this interesting. I hope it's given you some ideas for what you can do. Because I think part of the challenge is not to get freaked out by this. Part of the challenge is to say, if we know that we could be ending up like BlackBerry or Nokia, or any of these other firms, uh, what are some things we can start to do now as leaders that would help us get better positioned to take advantage of those opportunities to come? Thank you.
Um, thank you. Let's uh, give uh, Rita another round of applause. And, uh, Matthew Miao, uh, chairperson, chairman of uh, Montag Cinex Group. Uh, 苗董事长, uh, 上个月才代表台湾, 参加APEC, uh, 亚太经合会, 回到台湾, uh, 苗董事长, uh, 莲花神通集团已经成立四十多年但是不断的创新然后最近电脑事业转进了这个长步型笔电是中国大陆到现在都还没有办法接近的一个行业那苗董事长他也有这个合资先生的称号所以待会在很多的这个合作跟开发新的
because uh, internet banking uh, is quite popular in that time. And currently, when you see, for example, in China, uh, the founder of Alibaba, uh, Mr. Ma Yun said that if banks do not change, let's change the banks. So if you do not change yourself, surpass yourself, then somebody will change you. So I, I think uh, in uh, each industry, uh, we should learn the lesson. We should um, maybe constantly uh, reconfiguration, yes, or somebody will change you. Um, I, I just think it's, it's very, very true. It reflects um, my research. I was actually interested, you were telling us about a disengagement story that, that you had involving the personal computer. It might be interesting for the group to hear how you, how you came to that decision and then how yeah, you executed no problem. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah uh, like Rita said, it's, uh, very few people have this uh, SOP for disengagement. Very, very, um, but it's a sensitive subject. It uh, always reminds me of the, when we have a, don't have a SOP for succession plan. You know, because in the Chinese community or in the uh, industry, uh, business I will have here, so people don't want to think that one day they will be gone or that. But I try to be very brief recently in my, many of my meetings with my management and saying that, that you know, you ought to have a succession, but I didn't say about me, I just mentioned that you must work out because I worry about it. once my senior manager all retired, what are we going to do? So, so, but I always never thought myself. So this is a very interesting uh, subject that, uh, for disengagement. So, but, uh, uh, I don't think uh, we can really sit down and uh, work out uh, a disengagement plan, but I think we'll follow your speech that you just uh, talk about, we had to think about continually changing, rather than really emphasize a lot on the disengagement, but we do uh, try to work on the strategies, uh, how to change the strategy, but unfortunately, that um, if you let uh, your people go free and, say, and uh, think about you know, think about something entire new, uh, this might be difficult. So what do we do is uh, we try to work out some guidelines for, for our uh, different business units. So, so I say simple guideline is uh, to have a strategy in, um, in um, vertical and uh, horizontal. So what does this mean is that you still think something that close to Close to you. Vertical means could be supply chain. If you are in one of, no matter if it's in electronics, in uh, in petrochemical, in the food business, that we try to think the area very adjacent, adjacent to our own business, and we find a lot of lot of interconnecting uh, business that we can engage into, and this also can be not so totally foreign, so and uh, brings you better uh, success rate. So that's, we, we advise our people to think vertically and the, the supply chain for one of the business we are in. The secondly, horizontally, what does this mean? Horizontal means uh, maybe our business in manufacturing. Thinking horizontally means that thinking about how to change your manufacturer into service type of business. You know, for example, you know, how to add value. Uh, this is probably uh, very similar to your last point about how to improve efficiency, how to, how to add value. So services are a lot of added value to think and uh, with this better customer satisfaction, satisfaction where there's a new, even new business model, for example, many of the products we sell, uh, we need to have a back-end uh, back operation, back services, all that. So that the sort of guiding guiding our people to think uh, outside the box, but still totally uh, out of control, and out of our space. So I think we still have some kind of uh, better property for success rate. And, and my research would be consistent with that, that if you try to go too far in one big leap, that that's not usually very successful. 
One other idea uh, that I'll just talk about briefly is a lot of times I hear from leaders, well, how do I know if a customer wants it? Well, you know, in this day and age, you can actually test that hypothesis in a very inexpensive way. So let me give an example. One of the participants in a course that I teach at Columbia on strategic growth uh, really learned about how entrepreneurs do things. So he's Brazilian, and he runs a manufacturing operation in Brazil. And one of his biggest pain points is that he found there was no reliable service to ascertain the quality of the suppliers, primarily in Asia and India, that he was using to generate some of these. So Brazilian-based business, suppliers in India and China, and he had found a few good individuals, but there was no real service that offered this. So what he did, I thought this was so smart, what he did was he went to a trade show, which was full of other contract manufacturers like himself, you know, people that, that do that kind of thing. So a whole bunch of people who might be customers for this, and what he did before he went is he printed out a brochure, about 50 of them, offering this you know, certification service for these overseas plants as a service. Now, to look at the brochure, he wouldn't know that there wasn't a company behind it. All he was trying to do was see if there was a market need. So he goes to the uh, trade show, hands out the brochures at the display table, and gets two expressions of interest. He responds to those, and within one month, he has a request for proposal for that service. So he left his job, started his own company, and today they have over 100 people working on that kind of certification. But notice, what did it cost him to test the demand for that idea? 50 brochures, that's all it cost. Um, and so I think you can test a lot of things very inexpensively these days without having to be uh, putting a lot at risk. Yeah, uh, we can find new opportunities in anywhere if we pay attention. Uh, so um, I got feedback from the, the, the people read uh, Rita's book and uh, they are fascinated about the idea of arena. And uh, that's uh, how we can discover uh, new opportunities and uh, to spark new challenges. So I would like to know, uh, uh, because the boundary of the industry is blurring every day and uh, like FinTech, who knows uh, what comes next. <laughs> So how do you, uh, what's uh, your way to, uh, to find new opportunity or uh, spot challenges in your business? Maybe you can start from Joseph? Sure. Uh, I think uh, three main drivers will change the face of the financial industry. I think the first uh, still come from the customer behavior. So what customer want and what is the job to be done? For example, uh, 30 years ago, your branch is your bank because you just went to the branch uh, to get a service. But uh, later, uh, we use ATM and then we use uh, call center because it provides convenient service. And then 10 years ago, internet banking, currently mobile banking. So when the customer change their behavior, it just bring the challenge at the same time with the opportunity. And I think the second driver come from the power of technology because uh, the IT technology make pro progress day by day. So maybe uh, we cannot do it uh, 20 years ago, but we can do it now. But uh, who is the first one to use the power of technology to provide a service? I think uh, that will bring a lot of opportunity. And third thing, I think uh, because uh, the banking industry is really highly regulated industry, so the regulation is quite important. For example, uh, in this January, uh, the third party act is per market. So I think it provides new opportunity. So uh, for ESAN, uh, we set up our digital banking division very soon and we just change our resources. For example, for the IT department, we just change a little bit people into the digital banking division because the traditional core banking IT system uh, is very stable, but I think maybe it was spend two or three years to develop the system. But in the digital banking, I, I think uh, two years, in two years, the game is over. 
So we cannot wait. So we just invest in speed IP. That means in one month, actually, you will have your version one AP app. And two months later, the second version and the third version. So time to market is quite important. But I think the most important thing is uh, time to make a value for your customer. So I think if you can think very basic driver for your industry, what you would well, change uh, the face of your industry, I think you can see a lot of challenge. At the same time, you can see a lot of opportunities. And just as uh, Rita mentioned in her speech that uh, that come from the, the leader, leadership is very important, how you envision your company or your business in the future, maybe in five years. So how do you envision Ethan Bank, a banking service, in five years? So we can know what's your arena. <laughs> okay, that's good. Currently, we just see a lot of challenge. For example, segment uh, is the core business of banking industry. But currently, the third party payment, they still can provide a service. For example, lending, is our core business. But currently we see peer-to-peer -peer lending. Currently it's booming. And for example, wealth management is quite important. But currently you can see the online consultant company that can provide complete wealth management service. Some is free and some will charge you maybe only 0.2% uh, of your asset under management. It's more cheaper than the banking uh, provide service. So we just find a lot of competitors. But we think that is the force for ESAN or for the banking industry to surpass itself. Because if you want to compete, you have got the new idea. How can you, you know, have the innovation to conquer and to compete and to provide the valuable uh, service to your customer? So I think I, I, I totally agree about the concept about arena. It's not just like a chess checkman and you kill the queen or king, you win the game. No, it, it's not just like that. It's different arena, you just compete and then you just get the territory in every arena that you make a successful business. I totally agree with that, yeah. Um. Uh, Mr. Miao, uh, would you uh, give us an example because your company, uh, you have a lot of industry, cross industry, and maybe you can give us an example because you okay. do a lot of transformation. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll try, but uh, first of all, I read uh, Rita's book, I think really, I, I didn't know you played Go game. This, this is great. And, uh, I grew up playing Go. It shows you how, how advanced <laughs> my parents Wei were. Isn't that amazing? This is, uh, this is uh, also a very good example of to how to find similarities uh, in this arena, this space, rather than focus on my industry. Uh, so this is very interesting. So, so I can use one example, which, uh, which in our uh, in our situation, for example, uh, as you go back to um, this within our boundary of business, which we operate. So, for example, Taiwan, uh, we are very short of uh, uh, energy resources, so we rely very much. On the imported uh, LNG. LNG, we import about uh, 10 million uh, tons of uh, liquefied uh, natural gas at a very cryogenic temperature, very low temperature. So, so this is the evaporator into um, household use for for household for, for gas and also use for uh, uh, generate the electricity. So, but tremendous amount of cold energy uh, are, uh, come, are wasted. You know, so. So first we, we think what we use for cold energy. So we are in the business of air separation plants to, to liquefy the air and then separate into uh, nitrogen and oxygen uh, in some simple way to do. And then you have to cool down the air, liquid air, compress it, cool down, compress it, cool down, and then evaporate distill at different temperatures. So one great thing we did was to actually take in this cold energy and then make it into ASUs, air separation. So the first uh, LNG terminal was built in the south. We use that and to, to pipeline the evaporated gas to the households and to the uh, to the factories, which will generate electricity. Uh, 
Uh, then the second one we built uh, just finished last year, and that was in Taichung Harbor. And then Taiwan is built a new terminal because we have more and more shortage of uh, energy. So, but thinking about the cold energy you can use. So uh, for refrigeration warehouses, and uh, Google just set up a data center in Taichung, and uh, I think uh, Facebook, Amazon is coming. They, and they use tremendous amount of energy as well as cooling systems. And uh, so, so we, we say also this for, uh, also I'm posting this also for our agriculture use, because agriculture, when you raise many shrimps and crabs and some fish, they want to be the cold temperature. I would do is a connected pipeline to this. So this is really uh, in the, I think this probably fit into Rita's so-called arena in the space rather than one thing, we actually can derive many, many types of businesses, right? In the petrochemical business, we operate in many factories across, uh, uh, say, in, in China. And the petrochemicals, so we used to generate all, all the particular petrochemical reaction we have is an exothermic reaction. So it generates a lot of heat. In the old days, when their energy was cheaper, run better than it was not a problem. So now we sell the steam to the neighbor. And then because logistics is very important as a major cost factor for in addition to raw material. For chemical plant, you want to be close to the market, uh, also close to the raw material supply, but you, you are neither, you need the logistics. So because of that, we built a fleet of logistic trucks to handle high pressure, cryogenic, and they're fully equipped with GPS, so the GPS, so we run a transportation company now for high pressure, cryogenic, or hot temperature, uh, dangerous cargoes, and the fully equipped with the GPS. And we have a huge monitoring center for, for monitoring how safely those drivers uh, are driving the trucks, how efficient their routings are, how much rest they are getting. And, and then we invite the customers to take a look is a turning our manufacturer into a service industry. Yeah, and, and uh, so we sell the steam, we run the logistics, and uh, we got to charter some ships for similar things, and we have a short tanks to store, you know, warehouses for, for very specialized chemical product. So actually, what I, I uh, the inspiring thing from Rita's book is that is, is, uh, you have to continue to thinking about the the, uh, the new strategy, you know, yeah, because business is evolving very so fast. And so, but, but it's not so difficult either because it's all surrounding you. You're just not paying attention to analyze those. So, so that's why we, uh, in our uh, management philosophy, uh, again, I, I don't want to, uh, to we cannot uh, challenge or compete with uh, Rita as a really advanced idea, but we come to the basically of 3D philosophy you know, we talk about the velocity doing things, uh, visibility doing things, and the value added. So the, um, the, the, the what is those are things? This, uh, visibility really is uh, uh, not even talking about big, big data analytics. Really the current availability of the software, business intelligence, BI. So we take all business model, we put ERP data as parameters all fit into the business intelligence system. You get a lot of information out of it. So you have a good visibility, you know, they become, suddenly become very wise, you become visible to a lot of things, not in, in addition to the data. The velocity really build up your, your building up your, your capability so you can react, and you know the business, and you can, you can quickly uh, add, uh, add more business to your existing business. So those are the things, again, it's very, very, uh, I'm glad I read your book. Summarize the things I want to say for me. We have all time, but uh, now I can say it in an organized way. Okay. Uh, Rita, do you have any comments about? Well, I think this is a beautiful example of some of the leadership principles I'm talking about, where you take all this complexity and say, look, here's the three things I want you thinking about, right? Uh, is it creating more visibility? Is it really adding value? And to whom? And what was your third one? It was, it was, uh, the last one is the added value. I didn't talk value. much about that. So visibility and and the velocity. Velocity. That's right. Yeah, that's um, so that's you know just to connect that to what I was saying earlier. Now that's not going to tell people exactly what to do, but it's going to frame for them. You know, and I mean um, 
Amazon is very good at this too. So Bezos has always said that he operates his investments on the principles that customers are always going to want high quality, lower priced goods delivered more quickly. He's, nobody's going to want lower quality, you know, expensive goods delivered slowly. So if I start with those as the key principles of where I'm going to invest, now it simplifies complexity. I understand what you want. And it allows me then to use my creativity, if it were working for you, to say, OK, well, here's a way we could increase visibility. Here's a way we could increase velocity. Here's a way we could add more value. So it has that effect of taking all this complexity out there and sort of saying, no, 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 focus your energy here. And that's so critical. I have to say. That's very impressive. And just like uh, uh, Matthew described that, uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities we can explore and that we can expand. But the resources are limited. All kinds of resources, even time, is limited. So how do you decide um, what to um, get engaged? But, uh, do you have any hard indicators uh, that you decide? Uh, and uh, what are the soft side or human side when you decide to disengage some business or move some resource to another business? Yeah, I will start with my view. Well, the, the, the business uh, uh, unit leader, whoever screams the loudest, get the most resources. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, so again, uh, we are operating in a kind of uh, semi-traditional uh, space so that uh, we do uh, work on the budget. So, so, um, so no matter what new idea we have, we still need uh, uh, a cash cow that to support our, uh, our business and uh, to grow our, our uh, core business. And that, uh, that I don't think uh, any company should give up their core to jumping from one thing to another, even though I think that what Rita means changing is that still, I think, means the same. You still have a core business, but you, you allocate some resource for new things. So in our situation, that uh, it's not like uh, what you mentioned, some other company, very good company, uh, to donate 10% of the profit. But actually, we, uh, the, the profit that we use business, so actually, uh, we, we actually budget in such a way we form uh, venture capitals. Uh, uh, and then we raise 50% of the fund internally and 50% on site and to uh, incubate good ideas. And if those uh, are successful, we will invest from our core business. Uh, Secondly, of course, we always uh, uh, always challenge, we encourage internal, uh, build up internal businesses and scale up. So in the past year, we have spun off quite a few companies and they grow into large ones and, uh, and, uh, and also even IPO. So the third one I found recently, I think uh, I, I'm very uh, thinking a lot of uh, merger acquisitions, which is, uh, is a good way which, uh, to grow very fast not really for, for the business uh, that you want to get in, but also that you, uh, I think, uh, uh, either touch on the subject of the, the talents of people. So if we do a merger acquisition, actually very important to get a good team. And those teams, not only they are good, but they actually are, they might be in a slightly different uh, axis and operating axis so that you can uh, actually move faster to the next space and then to the next arena. So I think that, I think that the, the re resource allocation, we don't have a, again, we don't have a specific SOP for it, but the ideas always say, I think, again, this fall into this concept that we, in, in order to change and to keep up the, the, uh, the business, business model change, also the environmental change, competition on that, sometimes the merger acquisition is, is a, on the inevitable way, and maybe it's the faster way of getting where you want to be. Joseph? Okay. Yes, uh, resources is always limited. And the resources in a company including, for example, your people, and your essay, or your capability, is always uh, limited. So I think the first thing come to my mind is your ambition and your vision. Because all the resources just follow your strategy, and your strategy actually is follow your vision or your ambition. 
So I, I think the first thing you have to decide what's your vision or your ambition in, for example, in next five or in the next ten years. Uh, for example, in Isan, uh, currently we uh, established in 1992. So we still young, we are only 23 years old. And in the third decade, we just set three uh, strategic goals. The first one is we, we would like to be the pioneer in financial innovation. So we just put a lot of effort in uh, innovation. We set up our uh, innovation team. Uh, we have our innovation center, and we put Peter Drucker, he said, in financial industry, innovate or die. Maybe to scare our people, <laughs> we have to innovate, just like land. Uh, we think that we uh, got very good performance in our financial innovation, especially in digital banking. And the second uh, goal for the third decade, actually, is uh, deployment in Asia market. So three years ago, we are only three operation sites. And currently, three years later, uh, we already have 18 operation sites in six countries because we just focus our uh, resources to reach our uh, Asia deployment. And I think maybe in one month, we will set up our uh, China uh, subsidiary in Shenzhen and soon we will have our semi branch in Australia. And the third part actually, Taiwan is our uh, mother country, so it's our home market. So we still have to get very performance uh, in uh, this market. So for example, the wealth management, the credit card, we almost double in uh, three years. So we think uh, the performance is really good. So I think the resources follow your strategy and your strategy follow your uh, ambition. So the first thing is to think maybe five or ten years what uh, will be like uh, as your company. So I think the picture is quite important. And something about uh, disengagement, we have some experience about disengagement. Uh, even in financial holding company, currently we only has for subsidiary. Actually, we already sell some of our subsidiary. For example, uh, security investment trust company, we sell it. Um, we uh, just free the uh, resources to our uh, trading desk, to our wealth management. And for example, we close our leasing company. Uh, we absorbed by ourselves our bio finance company and currently, we were uh, end and absorbed our uh, life insurance agency company. So we think if you can make sure what you would like to do, and this engagement is not so difficult because you can orderly to do the things. And especially you can learn something from this, uh, this engagement. For example, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we developed our e-coin. Actually, it's the prototype of third-party payment. It's almost uh, at the same time with Alibaba. But because in that time, uh, the regulation is really a streak in Taiwan, so we just fail. But Alibaba is quite successful in mainland China, so we close that business, but we learned a lesson. So two years later, when Alibaba just went to Taiwan to search their partnership. And Alibaba visited several banks, but all the banks cannot understand what Alibaba say. But Isan, we understand everything because we just experienced the same difficulty that Alipay already uh, experienced. So finally, uh, we are very good partner and we can cooperate to create value for our Taiwan business. We think uh, if you can learn the some lesson and to inform that lesson in your decision, I think uh, this engagement is not a bad thing. It will turn to be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. so uh, one more just practical idea, kind of building on some of what uh, these folks have said. Um, 
when, when I often get called into companies to talk about innovation, and before I go, I'll say, okay, well, send me you know, the last three meeting agendas that you talked about when important people got together to talk about important things. And if they say they want innovation, and yet when you look at the agenda, mm -hmm. it's number 18, you know, right after material safety data sheet update. You know, assuming you're not going out and systematically hiring the most stupid people you can find, your people are gonna know whether you're paying attention or not. So my, uh, my golden rule is whatever you've decided is strategically <coughs> important. So whether it's getting into new growth areas, whether it's innovation, maybe it's quality, but if it's really important to you and you want the organization to pay attention, it needs to be in position one, two, or three on every agenda. It needs to be what you talk about when you meet people in the hallway. It needs to be what you personally are paying attention to. And that's a wonderful way of just inexpensively beginning to get the organization much more aligned around what it is you want them to accomplish. But if it's not on your agenda, it won't be on anybody else's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the um, human side, people issue, and uh, internal communication is very important. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, resources, and uh, there are lots of resources outside uh, corporations and uh, like uh, Matthew uh, just mentioned about uh, merging acquisition, that's one way. And uh, uh, nowadays we have seen lots of uh, new startups. They are uh, really assets light, like uh, Uber or Airbnb. Um, Airbnb uh, it doesn't own any hotel, but that's the huge hotel chain. So that's a whole new model. And uh, it seems that um, nowadays it is important to acquire and to utilize the resource, but you don't have to own the resources. So I don't know, uh, what's your observation and uh, what we can do about this new, new trend? Maybe we can start from Matthew, you are the Mr. Joint Venture. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, again, I tried to recap uh, what Rita mentioned this morning. It's very interesting that, uh, uh, you know, name which you, came, you mentioned the Brumble, the former chairman of CMO, a good friend of mine, oh. C.K. Chow, he was the actually, Bramble's. yeah, no, the early one, he, oh. CK, he was from Hong Kong actually, ah. and, but he lived in Australia and the travel between UK and Australia, and uh, he was every time talk about it, and, uh, he had to handle uh, hundreds of millions of pallets, and uh, how to do that efficiently. All that and they training. don't know where they are. Either. But they don't, they literally send them out into the world and hope they come back. <laughs> so this is a very, very interesting how to handle those uh, hundreds of millions of pallets. But, uh, you know, the example we gave was uh, very good too, that uh, sometimes, you know, the pallet change in, or, you know, you, you save a lot of uh, transshipment on that. Uh, I was working, uh, I was, sit, I sit on the board of uh, a British Oxygen as independent director many years ago. And uh, we always talk about a choir company called Lindy. Lindy is a German company. And uh, we made offers and offers two, three, four times and uh, without exception. But one day we got, uh, we got an emergency uh, uh, board of director call saying, Lindy is acquiring us. <laughs> Lindy from Munich is a German company. And Lindy was a forklift truck company. Many hundreds of years ago, uh, Dr. Lindy, he invented the commercialization of oxygen and all that. But uh, then it became very small, then went into the uh, forklift business and became very big. And their shareholder with Deutsche Bank, the Commerce Bank, Allianz and all that. And though they all came up and have bought BOC. It's interesting, now I sit on the Linde board, a German, German uh, board, and they probably speak German during the board meetings. Not that I speak German, but immediate translators. So, so this is very interesting, you know, how, how, you, uh, how you move from transform. So uh, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Wolfgang called me, uh, that he said, Matthew, you are the only board member has not approved on the acquisition of Linkair in the United States. Linkair is uh, 40,000 outlets for, for uh, small clinics to take care of. It's a four point spent $4.5 billion to acquire that one. And I say, this is going to make you rosy, looks very bad. But the profit actually is, is actually good. It's, it's, a, it's expensive. 
but it talks it talks about the, the joint ventures and the acquisitions, all that transformation from one business to another, and and uh, so uh, that is uh, very uh, interesting for me to observe as a uh, and the participate for in a way as an independent director in a di uh, directorship. So since then, I uh, we have formed a partnership 50-50 joint venture with Lindy in Taiwan. So we're very far, very young, uh, I should say, a relatively large company in Asia with with the joint venture and it involves the you know from from many uh, many different business because industrial gases has you know changed from oxygen driven to nitrogen driven. Many people don't know what does that mean because. The air molecules had 20% oxygen, 80% nitrogen. So if you're oxygen driven, you are very inefficient. If you become a, a nitrogen driven, very efficient. So uh, people heard about the TSMC moving into China for their uh, large group effect. This just approved last week. And uh, also uh, uh, this today's morning uh, that uh, Micron is acquiring Nanya to Infoterra. So, so uh, the largest memory maker, they all use a lot of nitrogen. And uh, so it's interesting to, to see all this happening and uh, the new applications and new business model all come into play. So, so, so it's very important for us to become a, uh, um, a business people and become world citizen of technology and uh, applications. So no matter uh, if it's a joint venture or you make it your only uh, business efficient or that, is this uh, fast changing, fast moving without the abreast of that to, to again, goes to, to today's topic. I think that's for us to watch very carefully. No matter what business you are in, you have to, you have to uh, cross border, uh, uh, realize the, the changes and the movement Yeah, because uh, financial industry need to <laughs> cooperate with other partners, yeah, sure. especially today. Yeah, I think uh, maybe there are four ways you can get your resource you need. And the first, uh, yes, you develop by yourself, but uh, you will take time. But for example, regarding talent, I think uh, it's a very good way. You develop your talent and take care of them uh, for a long time. And the second way actually is leasing. For example, we just hire McKenzie, we just hire Morgan Stanley, we hire IBM. Uh, so you can get the capability in short time. And the third way, I think, is acquire. For example, the FinTech currently is quite a uh, hard topic in Taiwan. Uh, we really think uh, the IT is the core ability of a banking industry. So we are the first one uh, to acquire uh, some IT company, it just announced uh, last week. So we think acquired is a very good way. And the fourth way I think is cooperation. Maybe the ecosystem, for example, we cooperate with uh, uh, Commonwealth and to take place uh, Master Forum. So we can invite a lot of uh, master to be Taiwan to make speech, just like uh, Rita Margaret. And for example, uh, we cooperate with uh, by a company Gent to develop the city bike in Taipei City, and currently you will all run the Taiwan. And for example, we cooperate with Alipay and PayPal in US, so we can build a platform for the e-business because uh, a lot of uh, Taiwanese uh, SME they cannot develop their channel uh, to uh, the world. So let can use the internet, and this platform can serve them very easy settlement. So we think uh, the ecosystem to cooperate with uh, the first tier company, actually is very good way to extend your capability and to make some good things happen. I think that's the full way to acquire your resources. I would like to ask, uh, um, is there any kind of qualities of the company that will make that very easy to cooperate with others or acquire resource very efficient? Well, a couple of ideas there. Um, 
I mean, I think as I said earlier, the, the boundaries of organizations are becoming much more porous. So figuring out where one starts and the other stops is a less straightforward proposition than it used to be. Um, one sort of idea from academia that I think is worth introducing into the conversation is that we used to have a distinction between markets and hierarchies. And the theory went, if something is difficult to describe, uh, if you don't know its value, and if you don't know exactly you know, how best to use it, that you really have no choice but to own it and run it within a company. And what the new technologies, things like Uber and Airbnb, and what those companies have done is they've effectively created markets for things that used to be too expensive or too complex to put on some kind of marketplace before. So what we're now seeing is, is markets emerging for assets which you used to have to own in order to be able to use them because it was too expensive. I mean, if you go back to the days of you know, early Xerox machines or fax machines, you could never do something on the scale of an Airbnb because it would just be too expensive to track all that paper down. Um, so one of the things I think the new technologies are doing is they're creating markets all over the place. And this is a huge trend that I think you need to be paying attention to. So Airbnb or Uber are famous, but if you look at Caterpillar, uh, you know, the big earth moving equipment, well, what people are now realizing is you can actually create a global market for heavy earth moving equipment, and you don't have to buy it anymore. You can just use capacity that's available. And so it's creating the opportunity, you mentioned leasing, to kind of lease assets and make markets for them where it never existed before. And I think that is really new. We've never been able to do that cost-effectively prior to this. I just uh, see the sign that uh, time is up. But I would like to, <laughs> I would like to uh, ask the, the last question. That is about Taiwan. I think that's the, the one of the reasons we gather here today. We want to have a better environment, uh, better growth next year and the years to come. And I don't want to see the, the GDP only 1% next year. So would you, please, <laughs> would you please share some advice for the business in Taiwan, how can we have a better growth and a profitable growth in the future? And uh, uh, where should I start? Joseph, and uh, we'll come back and no back to you. No pressure. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> um, Taiwan, which you should this is our hometown, this is our country. And they are only 23 million population but it's a lovely land that we live. So we should think of what we have. I think the most precious thing we have is our democracy and our liberty. Because in Asia, actually set aside Japan, Taiwan did very, very well in democracy and liberty. It's our lifestyle, so it's very, I think uh, we should very, uh, it's very good essay for us. And the second thing is, the people, uh, good education, uh, work hard, work smart, and actually some tourists always say that the most beautiful scenery in Taiwan actually is people. So I, I think uh, we have good people talent. And third thing is our SMEs. 97% of our company are SMEs. So they are quite agile, they are quite flexible and how can we structure uh, our SMEs to make the miracle, uh, economic miracle in the future actually is quite important thing. So for myself, I always think uh, to be a CEO leader uh, in a company, just like uh, the conductor of an orchestra. Yes, they have several experts, maybe it's come from Bali, it's come from maybe fruit, and there are some people, and there are some home, they are all experts. And how can you perform a very good music of Isan? I think that is the duty of a CEO, that's the duty of a, a conductor. And I think entrepreneurship, and to think outside the industry, and more innovation, it should be a good way, and we can uh, create uh, the better future, uh, I think for Taiwan, and for all the company, and for all the people, yeah. Um, 
Um, thank you. Just uh, came back from APAC. I know you have your observation and uh, advice. Okay, I guess this question is not very fair to Rita. She's only been here less than 24 hours. So for me, uh, that uh, you mentioned that I just came back from APAC, but the first one that's very important is that as a country, we need to stay connected with the world. So, uh, you know, with all the different FDAs going on, and uh, maybe uh, uh, Joseph mentioned entrepreneurship as an ease, that to facilitate them to uh, become stronger, they need to get connected, not be uh, tied up by the by the taxes, by the regulations, by the origin resource and all that. So all these kind of things, it's very important that we have an environment to which is uh, connected to the world. Uh, secondly, I think uh, that's, that's uh, more on the country side and the political side. And then for the business side, I think we need to be networking with various, various type of business. Again, like Rita mentioned, this is a, it's not, don't look at one industry. There's so many, um, synergies among different businesses and today they're really there's an ecosystem they're all connected and we need to uh, observe that the, what can come out of this uh, interaction among the different industries uh, thirdly i think as um, as uh, business people we need to be very uh, stay very global global minded and uh, and that's uh, both in the management uh, and uh, also in uh, sharing the look into the future, the vision of that, that, that you have to, cannot be very narrow and uh, look at one, one, not just the market, it's really the business model and the way doing things. Um, uh, lastly, but not the least, is that I think all, we need to really on top of this technology trend and, uh, and Rita mentioned all this uh, platform, all that, and the, that cannot be here without the today's uh, technology readiness of that. Yeah, I think those are the other, oh, one more thing that the first is Rita come to visit us more often. Oh, that would be a pleasure. I'm really enjoying being here. Although I have to say the flight in which I took the direct flight from New York and got to sleep immediately was fantastic. I woke up and I thought, oh, I must be really there. And then it was eight more hours <laughs> before landing here. Um, what I'd like to do is share with you the story of Ireland. Uh, and you think 23 million is small, Ireland has five. Ireland has less people than Brooklyn. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and what they've done is something very interesting and it might be informative uh, for Taiwan, which is they every few years convene a, a sort of a think tank, which is made of people from the social sectors, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, people from industry, people from unions, people from universities. I was um, very pleased to be part of one of these in 2003. And what they really try to do is give serious thought to how they're going to connect their government, their politics, their, their activities, um, by having this sort of very, very thorough uh, cross-sector uh, group that meets. And they take the recommendations very seriously. Now, if you think about Ireland and the desperate trouble they were in after the collapse of the Celtic Tiger days, and yet today they're much more, you know, they're, they're much healthier, they're more effective competitors. So I think the thought I would leave you with is to the extent that you can use your um, institutions to create a common point of view, that just has a multiplier effect on all the other things. You know, it multiplies the effect of entrepreneurship, it multiplies the effect of labor movement and discussion, it multiplies the effect of regulatory agencies. So I think I would, um, Leave that as an example for you when you think about who's got to be at the table when we're having these discussions. Uh, uh, thank you uh, all, and uh, uh, that's the end of uh, this panel discussion. And uh, thank you for all the uh, guests here today. Uh, uh